Hi, my name is Richard Shear, and this is Montpelier City Forum, where we're discussing matters of town meeting day. And I've had all of the candidates now coming in, and we do have contested races in all three districts, which is really good. Uh, Ann Watson is on. I have um, the school budget coming. Uh, those people will be discussing. And today we're going to discuss the city budget. And it is my distinct honor to have not only John Holler Mayor, but John Holler Friend. John is here to discuss his final city budget like as last mayor. Time, last time sitting here with you in this capacity, at least. So well, that thanks is for having true. me here. Hopefully we'll have you back again. I don't know in what capacity, yeah, we'll see. but hopefully you will be back again. Now, every time we do this, and we've done it a couple of times now, what we do is we talk about the city budget and the policy of the city. Mm -hmm. The city budget is not in isolation. It's drafted for reasons, and it's drafted for policy reasons. This city budget, how would you describe it in one sentence, other than re fiscally responsible? I know you'd start with well, that Well, I can one. make it pretty short. I don't, know, I don't know if I can do it in one sentence, but I can make it pretty short. My view of the budget is that this is largely just an exercise of the city council making a determination about what our city can afford in terms of increased spending that we focus our, the rest of the year talking about policy initiatives. But overall, in terms of the budget, our focus really should be how much do we want to spend. And you know, my view, and I've been clear about this since I became mayor, is that we needed to kind of restrain the trajectory of our, of our spending and keep it within the rate of inflation. And we've done that. So that's, you know, my goal has been every year for the council to set a target. Uh, and to do that within the rate of inflation and let the staff figure out how to come to us with a budget that meets that target. We haven't always been successful. The council's been split. We were split again this year, but a majority did agree to do that, to that approach. And we gave the city manager a target of I think, around 2%. I don't know the exact number that we gave him, or don't recall. And he gave us a budget, and when we've done that, it's really worked effectively. Where the, We've let the city manager do what he does with his staff, and that is to manage within uh, the spending level that the city set. And, and so we've done that, and the manager came back with a budget that, that is about, I think it was one, we started at 1.9, it crept up a bit with some things 2 that popped. 2.4, I think it's right. 2.4 is the, uh, includes the uh, ballot initiatives, which we don't really have any control over. So what's under the control of the city council is about 2.1%. Okay, now the minority on council, how did they view it? I think they would rather um, start it's a question of whether you start with sort of zero sum budgeting or you start with a cap. And our, our view is, you know, I think we have a finite amount. Others think, let's build a budget and see how much that is. And then if it's too much, we'll scale it back. And we've done that. And, it, you know, it can work. It can also be a really messy process because what happens is you get constituencies behind a whole range of new spending. Um, and then you have to battle it out. It, at city council about how much, you know, which programs go and which ones don't. And I think you end up spending more than people want to because it's very hard to say no in those circumstances. Now, when you inherited the city budget as council president, which is kind of an unusual position because you're just, I suppose you're the great, you're still a city councilor in a sense. You're a co-equal with a co-equal vote, but you can break the tie. Well, I'm not council president, you mean presiding officer. Exactly, so, yeah. as a presiding so, officer. Yeah, so, and that doesn't happen all that often. You know, every couple of meetings I'll break a tie. But more, you know, my role is really to sort of set the agenda and be kind of a spokesperson and set the political tone. for And lead the baton march meetings, <laughs> the, the three-hour meetings. Yeah, I mean, that's been a real challenge. I mean, honestly, uh, chairing meetings and managing meetings is a major uh, uh, task of the mayor, and that's not an easy one. We're, we've had a lot uh, on our plates, and, you know, my, my view has been, uh, you know, try and keep our meetings to three hours. That sounds crazy because it's a really long time, but you go longer than that. And I know in the past, uh, councils have, we have, uh, it discourages people from wanting to serve. Who wants to spend, you know, be at, at, at city council meetings until 11 o'clock and then have to get up and go to work the next day. So it just, and it, we don't, and I don't think people make good decisions when they've been at a four or five hour meeting. So we've been pretty good at holding those meetings to, you know, three or so, three hours or so, sometimes less. Um, 
When you took over the gavel from Mary, Mary Hooper, um, what was the budget like then in terms of process? Well, I don't think, uh, you know, honestly, I didn't follow the budget process, so I couldn't You couldn't were following tell it you. from the I school mean, board. I mean, I watched it a little. Yeah, I was involved working just on the, focused on the school board. I mean, the rate of growth had been more than I was comfortable with. I mean, not by a huge amount, but I mean, my bigger concern was that if you do it, our median tax bills, we were highest in the state. And so really my concern was, um, where we sat in terms of other communities. We were the highest, you know, in some measures, if you look at just median tax bills, what people pay, uh, we were the highest in the state, and that's not a good position to be in. So Where my view, I haven't done that calculation. We're, we're, de we're definitely lower than that. We're not at the top any longer. Um, so we changed that trajectory a bit, not you know dramatically, but we've held the rate of growth to uh, right around the rate of inflation. What was it like with the school budget? How many years were you school board president? I was uh, on the school board for nine years and chaired the uh, board for eight. And um, it's a little bit more complicated there because the spending taxes are determined based on per pupil spending. And that per pupil spending is a variable that, of course, varies as student population changes. And we did experience some decline in student population during that period. You know, overall, I think we were somewhat uh, slightly above inflation. It was not, not a lot. We had some. Pr early years where, because of the tax changes in Act 66, we saw a pretty significant reduction in our tax uh, rate here, and then it, it came up. I mean, but it was I, but constant I, overall, I think it was pretty constant. We certainly, it was a real focus, and we went through kind of the same exercise, and I think, um, you know, I think it was a responsible rate of growth. And when we talk about growth, I just want for two minutes to talk about the city's population and its population decline. Mm -hmm. What can we do to uh, be able to, do you see something on the horizon that will put us back above the 8,000 figure in the next decade? Uh, boy, uh, you know, the number one thing we can do is housing, um, provide affordable housing for people who want to live here. That's the number one concern that I've heard. It's been a, a huge priority for both me and the rest of the council. We spent, you know, part of the, the lengthy meetings that I mentioned before, we just, just getting through a new zoning ordinance. We spent, I have that on my list. You know, <laughs> probably 100 hours on that just at a city, at city council we meetings. Why do that? <clears throat> well, in part because we needed to update our zoning ordinance to make our city more development friendly. There were just a lot of, a lot of ways. How is it are, not development friendly because of the old zoning? I think just the number, just the way our districts were drawn, the way the rules that applied, there are just a million ways that they're, uh, and that, um, that our zoning made um, the development more difficult. Housing, uh, the way we uh, structured our housing, the ability to put in infill housing is was very difficult. The way multi-unit density, density is a big factor. Um, so housing is a, I think, a huge factor. Cost of development is uh, and the ability to get the return. I think this meant that developers just don't invest, and so we have, uh, I think, made that easier through the zoning. The other thing we did, this was controversial, but repealed our sprinkler ordinance for one and two family units that we were the only, or virtually the only city in the state to require that. It added $8,000 or so to the cost of any new construction. So if you've got an $8,000 cost in Montpelier and you go across the city line and build somewhere else and that's right off the bat, you're going to have lower costs, not to mention a lot of the other, other challenges of building in Montpelier. Uh, we were creating a disincentive. So I think those are a couple of things that we've done just in the last couple of months that are going to create a greater incentive. It's been, uh, you know, a hard thing to do. I've focused on it, talked to a lot of developers, worked on a couple of the larger, with a couple of the larger landowners in Montpelier to try and get them to uh, develop their property with not much success. But, you know, that's what, so to answer your question, that's the number one thing that we can do to make sure that we are an economically and culturally vibrant community. Getting back to the master zoning plan, <clears throat> that was quintessential Montpelier. It went through committees for months, if not over a year. How long did that process take? It was, uh, oh, well, it goes back, you know, probably six years on the zoning commission. We had a lot of challenges with our planning and zoning commission in our prior uh, um, economic development, or zoning, zoning uh, director, planning director. So when we replaced her, we were able to get on track. Um, and still, it was a two-year process that for that 
uh, group to get us a zoning ordinance, and then we kind of slogged our way through it. I think there were some on this planning commission who thought we should just adopt it. I, uh, without going through it, that I didn't agree with that. I think uh, residents felt like, and I'm sure other councilors felt like that was our role to really give that a proper Ultimately vetting. Ultimately, it compromised. From where the well, there were lots of there were lots you know uh, there there were nights where we made dozens and dozens of decisions uh, you know of compromises on a million different things and there were a lot of compromises and I think that the uh, planning commission had one view of a much higher level of d density and I think some of us were concerned that it created a risk of changing the character of our some of our neighborhoods how would that happen? the other well in particular I mean one neighborhood we heard from. Uh, uh, most loudly was the Town Hill area where we would have had uh, striking new density levels there that made the residents uh, pretty uncomfortable. And I think, you know, that's probably not where you want to have infill development, where you have right. to have people driving into town. It's not that much different from developing anywhere else on the edge of town. Um, but we did have infill, make infill development much easier in, in areas that are more walkable. and. Now, was there a, a, there was a robust discussion, I know, on downtown mm -hmm. and how much density and, and what kind of Well, not that much on downtown, actually. I think we, we sort of took the lid off. And, I mean, there's a height, dense, height restriction. Right. But other than that, I mean, we really don't have a density restriction in our downtown areas. Some of the areas where we did have were um, some of the adjoining neighborhoods, right. First Fortune. Avenue uh, and then the stretch along Main Street towards the roundabout, from the right. library to the roundabout, there was a lot of discussion about density in that area. Balancing, you know, is a legitimate concern. You've got, on the one hand, this beautiful, historic uh, city that we all want to uh, take care of and be responsible for, preserve. On the other hand, we need to allow for change. We need to allow for density. And so we really had to balance those two things. Is there anything in your mind on renters and, and how to improve the housing stock, how to make it cheaper. You know, realizing those are probably push me, pull me as, yeah. as you improve the housing well, stock. Well, I think I'd say the cost of rentals. Sure, I, I'd say two things. One is that our housing prices are high, so landlords have uh, plenty of incentive to invest in their properties because they're making uh, a good return on it. Um, we have a shortage of good renting, uh, rental properties, and that's just, again, a function of a shortage of housing generally. So if we're able to build more housing, I think that's going to alleviate some of that pressure. Um, one thing I would support, would, and we just didn't get to it, was a rental inspection program here where you assess a fee on uh, landlords uh, right, that, to provide that's not for... Uh, it's not in the budget, and it's just one we ran out of time, at least during my tenure, to take up. It would have been somewhat controversial, because I'm sure there's some landlords who would not support that. It's an additional fee. And a, would you think you know, that it would does be cost to, Well, and it goes... I don't, know, I, I don't know what it would look like over time, but it does impose another cost, uh, you know, in a, in a market where you're trying to lower costs, but at the same time, having some assurance that our properties uh, do have sort of minimal basics and meet code requirements, I think, is but probably again, something we should do. the cost of the license or the cost of the inspection itself is just the beginning of that process. I mean, everything will ultimately be passed on. Well, the if a landlord's not uh, not complying, then, right. um, you know, they're going to have to invest and bring a, an apartment up to code. And those costs may or may not. I mean, it, I think our market is tight enough where landlords are already getting enough return to be able to provide habitable and, um, you know, co uh, uh, units that meet code requirements. I might as well they don't it. always, they don't always do that. Not, you know, most do, most are great, but there are some that don't, and I think that's a program we probably should create. I might as well let you pat your own back and say that uh, renters were benefited by getting rid of the winter parking ban. Yeah, that's one that we did early on, and you're right. I hadn't thought about that for a while, but I think that is a quality of life change. It's it's helped people a lot who don't have access to driveways or garages and are able to park them now, especially with the winters changing. We just don't have we don't have a need to. So just to, for anybody who's watching, we years ago used to have a requirement where November to April, you couldn't park on the streets uh, at any time, and so that regardless, was, of, regardless of the weather. So uh, it's hard to imagine that now because we really have the winter parking ban, you know, once a week or so. And uh, but that really has changed for, uh, for renters. Improve the quality of life for renters and others who don't have access to parking. I know at this point that people are sitting and saying to themselves, at least some people are, ask them about Saban's Pasture, hmm. since we're talking about housing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Let's get into savings. Well, pressure. it's one that I've uh, supported development there for for a long time. I, you know, some have wanted to develop the entire parcel. Uh, my view is that when there was a plan. Let me back up. There was a plan that was a, a group that a savings pasture working group that that considered this issue a dozen years or so ago, and it was comprised of housing advocates, uh, the property owner, the uh, conservationists, and they came up with a plan that I've supported, which would allow for dense development along Berry Street with the preservation of the property up in the upper pasture. That's the way ultimately the property is zoned under the new zoning. Uh, there's an incentive to retain the open space in the upper parcel with high density at the lower level, which is what the landowner asked for. We weren't success haven't been successful in, uh, in in uh, persuading the landowner to develop that for housing, but you know that's also, I'm sure, a function of the market. So I'm hoping that happens at some point. I think that's a perfect place for development. Now, the Vermont College of Fine Arts is a player now. In yeah, and I think they are probably further along. Um, we uh, also did the similar zoning uh, with density along Berry Street to encourage that, and I think they do have some plans that are in the works. There are a lot of, I mean, I think there's a real potential to see that area of town uh, change uh, with the bike path that now is going to go into construction this, this summer, uh, the new um, Caledonia Spirits uh, project across the street. There'll be some river access there, so I think it's going to be an attractive area with, where we're going to see more happening in that area of town. Now, at the same time, you'll be working under the streets in that area to expand our utilities and the like? And working on utilities is probably extending those towards the Caledonia Spirits. Right, that's going. If you drive out there now, you can see that work has been gone, going through the fall and into the winter as well. So that's a hop, a skip, and a jump away from across the street, which potentially could be housing. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So there's a synergy between those. I think so. Yeah. And I've, you know, we've told the landowner at Saban's Pasture that at least, well, I'm not going to be part of this, of course, but that the city. I would hope uh, would be part a partner with them and provide some infrastructure support for uh, housing development on that lot. What is a TIF? Everybody talks TIF, you about know, the TIF. They say it's complicated. I, 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 maybe this is my simple mind. I don't, I don't see it as that complicated. TIF just basically says, well, stop. If, okay. TIF is tax incremental finance. Tax okay. incremental financing, and basically it says that if a private developer develops in an area that's designated for a TIF district. We take the tax revenue from that development and we put it back into paying for public infrastructure. It's really that simple. So if somebody builds a hotel, for example, we'd take the tax money that we would otherwise get from that for a period of time, I think up to 20 years, and put that money into the infrastructure to support that development, assuming that it's going to provide for public benefits. So in the case of the, of the, the hotel, uh, there's been a proposal for a, a garage, uh, and there'd be other infrastructure needs, I think, that would support that if they could show that there's a public benefit and that they wouldn't have built this project without the support, without that TIF district, and without those public uh, um, uh, inv investments, then the state will approve this TIF district. You'd take that additional revenue that you get from the hotel that we'd otherwise see, and you'd pile that back into paying for the bonds for that pay for the uh, uh, the infrastructure, whether that's a, a parking garage or road so improvements. So it's very, very so specific. Just that hotel. Well, the, be the application I think that we're submitting is much bigger. So I'm using that just as an example because that's one that's on the table. We have a very specific proposal for development there. But I believe that our TIF application will be for will be all the way down Berry Street and encompass right. Sabin's Pasture as well. So the same thing could be in Sabin's Pasture, where if we at a housing development, uh, there the needs would be for road and water, sewer, and sewage infrastructure. We'd take the project, the revenue that we would get from the development of that site, and put that into paying for those infrastructure improvements that would be needed to support the housing. And there, I think it's very clear that without that kind of public investment in infrastructure, you're not going to see those kinds of projects. Right, so the tax rolls wouldn't reflect that anyway. The yeah, existing. right, because they're not going to happen. And that's, exactly. that's the, that's the so-called but-for standard. And it's controversial because not everybody believes it. I think here, the argument, the proof is in the pudding in my opinion. We've had so little development here that I think we can say it's not going to happen unless we can provide new tools. We've got Caledonia Spirits. We created essentially a mini TIF, and we, we created just, so you got two pots of tax revenue. One's the educational Education property mm -hmm. tax, the other is municipal. 
we control the municipal tax. We took all of our municipal revenue and put that into infrastructure support for Caledonian Spirits. Even then, we were just barely able to make it work. What um, happens to the school revenues? That will go to the state. So the state certainly will benefit from Caledonian Spirits development. They are that because they're not part of the TIF district. So they, while we waived or, or reinvested the municipal tax dollars, the they'll pay the, the normal education tax bill just like anybody else. When we talk about development in the city, again, I'll let you congratulate yourself. When I spoke with you before you became mayor, you came on my show mm -hmm. and, and, and talked about what you wanted to do when you were mayor. You talked about building street infrastructure, mm. working on streets. Sure. Could you talk about that, well, that in, was in a, a longer that, perspective? Well, that was one of uh, sort of the top three. That was maybe the, maybe the highest. Our, our roads were in, in pretty dismal shape when I became mayor, and I was very concerned at the level of spending. We were, I think there was one year where we spent $60,000 on our street maintenance. Um, clearly, it was inadequate overall. So first step was to say how much... How much should we be spending? How much are we spending? And the, the result of that analysis was about a million dollar gap. And so we came up with a six year plan to, to get to that million dollar a year additional spending. We're about there. I think this year gets us $900,000 more than we were when we started. So is that $900,000 a year? A year. More? So we're at that point now where we're in FY19, we'll be spending about $900,000 more than we were six years ago when I became mayor. Um, there's the good news, bad news to that. I mean, the good news is that we're spending almost a million dollars more. The bad news is that it's our roads are still not in great shape, and you can see it now, of course, just the way the weather conditions are with the potholes and so on. So it's, you know, it's not good, but it, it'd be a lot worse if we hadn't uh, ramped up our spending. I'm hoping that million dollars, actually, our latest pro budget proposal provides for it to go up by a little more than a million. I think the staff realizes now they underestimated the amount to which we were really underspending. And so we've that, ramped that up to, you know, maybe 1.1 million. So this increase is going to continue. The challenge with that, of course, is that you got to get that money from somewhere. And we, they, we had a pretty significant shift of resources over time from other city programs. What would that so shift the, entail? What's a city program that would well, have been we're for, paying you know, for it? We wanted to talk about police force. We reduced our police force by one, the fire department by one, planning department by one. I mean, a lot of it was, and then a lot of things just on the margins by holding uh, different programs in check or, you know, re small reductions here and there to cobble it together. Uh, the other uh, piece of it, the way we funded it, was by increasing the local option tax. That was about hundred and some thousand dollars a year. It's going to be right. Now when we talk about the streets, that's one thing. Well, what about under the streets, the waters and sewer? Right. You know, I think you and I had a lot of conversations about this and uh, about, you know, what, it's obvious when you look at the above ground what's deteriorating, but what about, what are we ignoring? And so we did an in-depth analysis of what we need to do to make sure that our underground infrastructure is uh, in reasonably good shape over time. And we came up with a 50-year plan to replace all those pipes, sewage, and water pipes. So it's a, and it, our our infrastructure, our water sewer bills are going to go up. I think it's about two and a half percent a year to pay for that. But there is a long-term capital plan to ensure that we uh, we ultimately replace all those underground pipes. Our Department pipes. of Public Works uh, came in with a request for a new software package to help with that um, inventorying our our pipes. I had heard that. Our system was in such disrepair that we didn't even know where pipes were under the ground in some areas. Is that true? Well, that may be. I mean, these are you know more than a hundred years. It's a, well over a hundred years. Some uh, some are probably closer to two hundred years. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure that a lot of that infrastructure is in pretty bad shape. How do you leave the infrastructure of downtown now that? Um, you're um, leaving your mayorship. There's been a lot of downtown infrastructure infrastructure construction over the years. Yeah. Is that pretty much over? Well, I think so. I think our, our downtown is in great shape. I mean, we had, a, a, of course, a lot of disruption with the construction of the district heat plant, but now all our downtown, or most of the downtown buildings are heated with renewable energy, which I think is good for the environment and good for us just as a community. Um, We've paved all the downtown roads and replaced most of the sidewalks. 
And we've invested in uh, you know, just improving the appearance of our downtown through the downtown improvement district. So we have uh, funding that I think is about $60,000 a year. A lot of that goes into marketing and events, but a lot of it goes into you know, flowers and benches and the amenities that just make a downtown attractive, make people want to be there, visit uh, tourists to come, come back, tell their friends and people who live here to want to be downtown. Uh, we've also have this uh, our parklet program where we have uh, encouraged merchants to create outdoor seating. Are there going to be other? We only still only have parking? one, I, uh, and uh, I'm not aware of. I've heard you know others thinking about it, so I'm not aware of any that are that are uh, imminent. And then you have Ward's Parklet. And then we have the parklet. Ward's uh, Ward's Pocket Park on on Main Street. Right, which is sort of an outgrowth of that uh, parklet uh, project. Um, so I think all that has created more vitality. Our downtown looks better. It's in better shape, and I think we've got more activity. So you know, I do feel good about that. We've put a lot of resources and effort into that. The other thing I'd put say about that is that we've increased, uh, strengthened the relationship between the city and Montpelier Alive. The real key to making our downtown work is having a vibrant downtown organization, and Montpelier Alive fills that role. They're great, uh, but they need the support of the city. That hasn't always been the case, but we've provide, tried to provide, and I think have provided a guaranteed level of support, increased it with the downtown improvement district, and just through regular communication with them. Any idea where we're going to pick up a new director? I think that I uh, understand they have made a decision on a new director, so that should, so that be, should be that, that, that announcement will be imminent. Well, what, what about the economic development board? Would you explain that to people? Its funding and what it does. Sure. So one of the other aspects, uh, one of the other priorities that we took on was promoting economic development. So we cr funded an economic development strategic plan. We used uh, somebody who's very good out of upstate New York, uh, Peter Fairweather, um, created a very accessible and sort of common sense, thoughtful plan that really has provided a blueprint for us. And, and there are a number of components we could talk about. Well, one of them was to create an economic development corporation. And that is basically an entity with a board and a staff member just focusing on economic development in Montpelier. So we did that. Uh, we created a sort of star-studded board in Montpelier, some real all-stars all who, uh, within the business community mostly in Montpelier, uh, but a really talented group. And they've hired an executive, they hired an executive director whose sole purpose is going to be to promote economic development. And unfortunately, he didn't stay long. We lost him after about six months. and. You know, that just happens, I, you know, it's it, with any organization. As well. But they're in the interviewing process right now. I, I understand that they've had some great applications, uh, applicants, so I think they'll replace that, hopefully get somebody who's going to be around for a while. And those, I think that position and that board can make a difference, but we're just, they're going to be, uh, How take is a little that funded? Long. So that's funded, uh, I mentioned the local option tax. The local option tax, we divided up really two parts. One, economic development, $100,000. And then uh, the remainder, I believe, which was for infrastructure, maybe 120 uh, for infrastructure. Now, what does that tax, that local options tax? Uh, rooms, meals, alcoholic beverages. There's another local options tax that people are using, and that's just on general purpose sales, uh, a sales tax. Mm -hmm. like, is that in the cards? Is there? Well, not, not in the cards for me, of course, but... Uh, you know, I've always thought that that, well, I had a couple of thoughts. One is that uh, that's a little more complicated because m downtown merchants, uh, or merchants who pay that anywhere in Montpelier, face a tremendous competition from internet sales. And that would, not, I don't believe that would be assessed for on internet sales. So just that discrepancy and the challenges from internet competition that you don't have for rooms, meals, and alcohol. Uh, so that creates a little bit of a different analysis. Um, I would have considered it if we could have, if we had a project that uh, where you take that money and use it and invest it in something that is going to increase the vitality of Montpelier, where you create, you know, sort of lift, more than lift, a skating rink, lift in all the state lift house. all boats, right? So that's an investment that merchants could say, yeah, I see that, and and I'm going to get a return on that because we're going to have more people coming here. We never really had that, uh, and so I I did not support having the local option tax just to deal with our property taxes because my concern is that we just spend, we just take that money and, and, and spend it. And, and I don't didn't think we needed, we didn't need that tax revenue to do what we need to do. If we have something new, you know, maybe, but that didn't come along while I was mayor. Farmer's market's coming to State Street. 
Yeah, I think you that's and a, Bill Fraser had worked on that for seemingly for yeah many years. It's uh, I think that's a great well, it was a great improvement last year, and I think that was obviously true for both the downtown merchants and the and the farmers market. They saw. Uh, a pretty significant increase in their sales. So, you know, one thing I always heard, people love having outdoor events on State Street. I know they're not always popular with merchants, but, you know, if they're done right, I think they can work. And that clearly does seem to be, there seems to be a synergy between having the farmer's market there and, and having support for our other merchants. This show is going to get boring with congratulations, but you've got downtown. <laughs> You're being awfully nice to me today, Richard. <laughs> you've got downtown makes housing up for the other ones. the upper floors. Yeah, they're starting. So Down Street Housing uh, started construction on the uh, what used to be called the Dickey Block, we're now called the French Block. Uh, you know, we had uh, I won't name names, but one of my city councilors says, "Let's stop talking about the French Block because it's never going to happen." Uh, but behind the scenes, we just kept working. Down Street was diligent and continued to work. They got the funding and stayed with it, and um, I think it's going to be a great project. The uh, sixteen or eighteen units, uh, maybe. Maybe 16 affordable and two market rate. Um, the irony with this housing development is that they can't afford to do market rate housing that because of the subsidies that are important that are really essential to making these projects work. You've got to put that into affordable housing, which is good. We need more market rate housing as well, and that's going to be a longer term challenge. You know, the same. I'll just continue on here. You know, Down Street is so important for our community. Without them, we'd have have had virtually no housing starts here in the last what have fifteen or twenty years. They did all of the new housing on Berry Street, the condos and the affordable housing units there. Uh, well, more than well, twenty some years ago, the Elm Street housing was all Down Street, and now. Uh, the French Block, and then Taylor Street. We, we lost the private developer on Taylor Street. Uh, they stepped in. We're waiting, they're waiting for a couple of the final com funding components, but uh, hopefully those will be in place and start construction this fall. Our beverage store, what's happening to it? The city has uh, bought that through the federal grants, and that building will come down and the, to make room for the uh, a recreation path as well as a driving entrance that will go to a parking area closer to the river, there'll be a new, uh, or new, I uh, should say, a, a commercial property has been uh, permitted that would be located in the parking lot between uh, the, the drawing board right. and Montpelier Beverage. So it'll be a new th three-story building there, um, and then the uh, the uh, new uh, recreation path will run adjacent to that, along with the drive that will support some parking, and then across, and there'll be a new pedestrian. Um, bridge across the north branch of the Winooski. Now you'll be able to bicycle all the way out east. How far? Be able to go the full length of uh, the city from the uh, railroad station to Gallison Hill. And then um, Cross Vermont Trails Association is working on getting funding to complete a bridge that would go across the Winooski and then the Cross Vermont Trail would go all the way uh, to Groton State Park. So. A lot of a lot of good, exciting plans in the works. There is one segment that we, I think, the city's going to have to deal with, and that is the Berry Street between the Rec Department and the, and Main Street. Uh, the bike path doesn't go all the way to Main Street. My goal had been to create a bike lane, and I hope the city future city council will do that. It's going to, there'll be parking challenges, but to replace some of those parking, uh, spaces on Berry Street, between Main Street and the Rec Department with a two lane bike path. Is there any um, chance for a, um, a traffic circle by uh, the drawing board? Would that have been I know discussed? that the, uh, the, the, the uh, our, tra our uh, public works department did get grant funding to do a study of that intersection. That's been what they call a failed intersection, F intersection, for a long time. Uh, it's not one, unfortunately, that we've gotten to while I've been mayor, but I know that that's at the top of the priority list. The, Challenge is there's not enough space right there, so you'd have to get some cooperation from some of the adjoining property owners to make that work. But you know, perhaps we could do that. But that intersection clearly needs to be addressed. There was also some discussion of a traffic circle at uh, State and Main. There was some discussion about that. Um, it didn't get a lot of support publicly. I think there are concerns about pedestrian access and the size of it and you know I think that was a pretty brief conversation I don't remember all the concerns there was a bright we had a grant that looked at a whole variety of different improvements for downtown and and that one just that one didn't get a lot of traction what should we look forward to in terms of 
construction of the actual multimodal terminal and how that will affect downtown traffic flow? Yeah. Well, there are a number of components to that. The biggest challenge that I think my successor is going to face and, uh, and the city council and staff is going to be parking the loss of, so we've got the new 16 or 18 parking spaces that are going to be used to support this new um, housing. housing on French Block. Losing, I don't know how many now, I think 120 spaces on Taylor Street. But that's Taylor a theory Street. because we've had that for rent and not a whole lot of people are, are renting those spaces. No, I think those they're being used, this, well, the state now leases it, so those are being used now okay. uh, this winter for state employees. You know, the demand, of course, for parking is really just the winter months, so there was no demand in the summer and fall right. for that. People would have parked it if it was free, but, but there is demand in the winter and the state has leased it. Those spaces are going to be gone. So that's 130, 140 spaces right there that are going to be gone next year. So that's going to be a, a huge challenge. That's kind of on the challenging side. On the upside, you know, we're going to have a brand new, beautiful transit center on, on Taylor Street. Also, we've got um, funding in place to pretty significantly increase the, just the streetscape. So you have new sidewalks, new street lighting, uh, new uh, vegetation along Taylor Street. So it's just going to be a much more inviting area, entrance into town. So, and then uh, and with the transit center, we also just agreed, selected new artwork to go outside. Right. Sculptural part, artwork. Uh, sculptural work, uh, part due from an NEA grant. Uh, the bike path and a little bit of green space. So, I mean, that, ha that area, although this has been, you know, one of my greatest frustrations is the time it took to get there. Uh, it does look like that's in place, and we'll see. Now some we have progress sculpture coming in on Taylor Street. Someone asked me to ask you about sculpture where the Econo Lodge is. Hmm. That big rock sculpture. What is that going to be? Boy, the rubble next to the Econo Lodge I, that we took down. Uh, you know, that's for privately owned spot. That was one of the things I hadn't should have mentioned that as I talked about accomplishments, and that's one that I'm pleased that we were able to get to. That took a lot of just sort of uh, persistence to um, to get us to uh, the city to adopt an ordinance to deal with this that uh, that lot as well as some other blighted properties, and then to enforce it. But the, the good, the, and and I have to give a lot of credit to the people who live around there. They were very patient. Uh, they were unhappy, but patient and kind of gently pushed us to do the right thing and force that property to, to get cleaned up. So that, that lot, I haven't been there recently, that's really been, I think, was used as a staging area for the, uh, for the construction of Northfield Street, and I think that's probably what it'll be used for as they finish that work next year. And then hopefully the, develop, the owner of that property, the Econo Lodge property, will develop that lot uh, into something useful. But it won't be a big rolls. mountain of rubble. <laughs> no, it won't be a big mountain of rubble. That would not, I don't think, consistent with the ordinance. So they would have to clean up the parcel. Um, let's stay up on the other side of, uh, of River Street, the water plant mm -hmm. and the methane project that came in during, during your time. Could you explain that briefly? Sure. Yeah, there's a, we have, uh, unfortunately, millions of dollars of un, uh, deterred maintenance requirements for our wastewater treatment plant. And... Uh, so there have been a couple of things, ways that, and, and we've had a, a good group of people, both the city staff as well as our energy committee, looking at ways that we could uh, both invest in the wastewater plant but find sources of revenue. One, was the, one of them would be to uh, invest in a way that would allow us to uh, better handle solids from, other, from disposal companies. Uh, so we've looked at that. The other would, uh, potential would be to create uh, a combined a heat and power a facility. So you take the methane and produce electric, electric power and put that into the grid and use that as a source of revenue. Um, the city staff have pursued both of those and none, neither of them have gotten to the point where they're really adequately vetted for council consideration. So I think that's going to be a very significant challenge for my successor. Like I say, we don't have the funding in place to pay for those upgrades. If we can't find a way to make create some revenue from those, I think it's going to be a real challenge for the city. But we have to do something. Have to do something to keep the plant in operation. It's got some maintenance needs that can't be deferred a lot longer. So it's future bonding on water and sewer. It's going to be some sewer. future bonding, and the question is how do you pay for those, and do we can we find a revenue source to offset some of those costs? What would that be? Well, through either... Uh, uh, greater capacity for solids, disposal of solids, or the uh, uh, electric power production.
Those are the, really the two options that we've looked at through a consultant. Or pick up a lot of housing that require or water. Or new housing, that's true too. Uh, let's go up the road a piece to Berlin, Berlin Pond. Consul has gone around and around and around on Berlin Pond. Could you succinctly explain that issue and where we are right now? Well, we just frankly ran out of options, legal options. I think Montpelier was united in wanting to preserve the pond and our water source under state law. We don't have the ability to regulate it. We didn't get the support of the legislature to give us that authority. We haven't had the support of either the prior governor or the current governor to give us that kind of support. Um, so, you know, frankly, we just ran out of options. So I think that there is likely to be some kind of uh, non-motorized boat access on the pond. And we'll keep an eye on it and, um, you know, hope for the best that there's not any kind of uh, contamination that either either threatens our water supply or forces us to upgrade our, our water treatment facility. I'm going to take you through a couple of issues that took consul time, the regional authority. Oh, sure, yeah, no, I was, uh, you were going to ask me about that. Um, you know, that's one where I, I got outvoted. Uh, um, I would have pulled the plug this year. I don't, uh, to the extent we could. Now, I, I guess this, let me unravel that a little bit. We created this uh, public safety authority that had, now has its own ability to put ballot items. I, I, I regret having done that. I think we've created something that really wasn't, it wasn't fully developed and still isn't, but yet it has this ability to go to the voters and ask for money. And I think we probably got ahead of ourselves. I got outvoted on that. Our council supported it. I've been, over the last three years, had sort of escalating level of concern about whether we're getting our money's worth out of this Do authority. Do they have a product yet? No, and that's why I didn't support funding this year. We've spent over $100,000 pursuing this. And, you know, the goal of this public safety authority is to save money. We have outstanding public safety resources in Montpelier through our dispatch, our, our police, and our fire. Um, and so I didn't enter into this thinking we needed to improve the quality of our, uh, our public safety services, but rather that we could do them more efficiently by creating better economy of scale with our neighbors. Well, unfortunately, our neighbors didn't want to join us. Barry has to some extent, but Berlin and, and, uh, and um, uh, Barry Town did not. And that really hobbled the ability to come up with a more efficient kind of public safety authority. So the authority now has kind of changed direction, focused just on dispatch. They're saying they're going to have a plan by November, and if not, they'll pull the plug themselves. So we'll see. I, I had just run out of uh, my view. We've put good money after bad for a couple of years, and it was time to just call the question. But uh, others, I think, have more optimism that something's going to come out of this. I just don't think we're likely to see uh, that kind of critical mass we need in order to provide um, public safety services that, that do, you know, provide that high quality we expect, but at a lower cost. I just don't, I don't see that. I got this question again from the public when we solicited it on our survey, Monkey. Do we have enough police? We're down a few police people. Well, we're down, I think, one from when I took office, and that was uh, the result of a review of a uh, of a staffing report that the city had consulted for right before I took office. And if you read that report, it seemed pretty clear that we had the a little, we had some surplus capacity. Uh, the police chief hasn't come to us and asked for more, although he's in, indicated that that may be coming in the future. I would really push hard and, and, and ask uh, my successor, future city councils, to look hard at our public safety numbers. I think. We, you know, talk a little bit about this before. I'm reading a, a fascinating book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, by a, a Steven Pinker, a Harvard a professor who's plot, sort of charting the uh, decline of violence uh, worldwide over the last couple of millennia. And the, the upshot of it is that we are living in the safest time ever in history. And we in Vermont are in one of the safest places in the world. Uh, so, you know, I think it's easy to, and he talks about this, easy to feel like we're living in a violent time, whether it's the school shootings or terrorism. But if you plot those out and look at it on an overall, uh, you know, overall societal violence, what we experience now is, is a fraction, a tiny fraction of what our forefathers, for par uh, uh, our predecessors experienced in society. And in my period, that's even more true. So, you know, we don't have a lot of violent crime, the, the high-profile exceptions notwithstanding, and we do have those. 
But I would argue we can't staff our police department based on incidents that occur, you know, once every 10 years or every 20 years. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at, at what kind of crime we experience, what kind of capacity we have to solve them. But let's, uh, you know, I really would push hard because I think that as a society we are becoming safer, not, not less safe. And uh, let's think about where we want to put scarce public resources to improve the quality of life for people who live here. And I would argue that having more police officers is going to create, you know, uh, infinitesimally more safe community, but at a cost where we, I think, uh, at a benefit, I don't think that's the best place where we can put our resources. How do we adjust to um, legal marijuana? That's coming up in in July. Is that a problem? Going it's to be a problem? Well, in our you know, it's, it's going to create some changes, certainly, just in how we deal with with, uh, with marijuana. I, you know, I, I don't know. We um, it, it certainly is going to create changes, but it's not going to be something we're going to see, you know, on the streets necessarily. We're not going to have recreational uh, marijuana available for purchase, uh, not anytime soon. So I'm not sure we're going to see dramatic changes in the near future. Longer term, I think we're probably going to see, you know, more like Colorado and Washington State, where, where you do have retail purchases, but not that's not going to happen. What about right pain away. pills? People with oh, opioids? opioids? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know that's a that's certainly a is problem a under the issue? surface. It it's, I think it's a. I don't think it's a police issue. We are fortunate here not to see the kind of crime uh, that results from high opiate use and then the commensurate addiction and the cost of addiction that you see in other communities. Um, but it, it clearly is a problem in our in our community. I think our police department deals with it well by focusing on it as a health problem. Not, it's really not a, they a have public a program, safety don't issue. They? And they have a, it's called Project Safe Catch. It's something that was developed by our police chief, as I think, uh, I can't remember, community in Massachusetts had, had created it. But basically the idea is our police department, when they get a call from somebody who has had an overdose or, or wants to uh, seek rehab, that they will provide, they'll drop them off. They'll pick them up and they'll take them directly to a rehab facility and, and in treatment. Are there treatment. enough, and in, are and there, there, enough are, we, there is capacity, as I understand it, in our community or Central Vermont to provide uh, rehab. So uh, it's it's a problem and it's not, you know, I think it's one that evolves. As I've heard, you know, it's not just opiates, but now I'm reading that we're starting to see a recurrence of meth and other kinds of, uh, wow. <laughs> of, uh, of illegal substance. So, but I think focusing on that as a, as a public health problem and not a, and not a, a, a police Problem is probably the best way. To, Something to called call force was eliminated. What is call force? I think there was a volunteer uh, aspect to our fire department. I think it's a, a remnant of that had uh, maybe existed for a while, but hadn't been utilized much. One of the ballot initiatives deals with the Central Vermont Internet membership. Mm -hmm. What is the Central Vermont Internet membership? What are we being asked to vote on? I don't know much about that. They uh, uh, and I have a. I do represent a client doing now consolidated communications, so I really haven't been involved in that discussion much. But my understanding is that this would be uh, an entity that could tap into the city's bonding authority without creating uh, liability for the city. So I think that you know, at its core, it has the ability to bring communities together, uh, bond for the, with a new entity called this municipal communication district, but that it wouldn't create uh, any liability for taxpayers. So the idea is to create, through uh, economies of scale, the ability to invest, uh, attract investors to invest in new um, uh, broadband infrastructure. The personal property um, tax at $10,000, could you explain that, the capping? That was an initiative that was brought to us by the city clerk who felt that the cost and the uh, just the friction of collecting that tax for small uh, small amounts of personal property wasn't worth it. So it created a hold harmless or a threshold. So below that, it wouldn't be a requirement to. Uh, I think it's only eleven thousand dollars, and that he felt that that would come up from other revenues. Yeah, I think it's a it's a small revenue loss, and avoids uh, sort of a big irritant for uh, some really small businesses. The development review board procedures and and membership and the like. That's another article. Could you explain that one to us? Oh, I think that's just a matter of aligning our current DRB memberships with state law. I think the way our terms have lined up didn't comport with state law or the, either the 
can't recall either the number of DRB positions. I think it was that. I think we didn't. We had either too many, or I should know this, but the number of positions on our DRB wasn't consistent with state law, so we needed to sync those. Uh, we have two taxing articles from the city side, one that will go to water and sewer, mm -hmm. and one that will go to sidewalks and the like, and some to Taylor Street if needed. Right. Could you explain both of those briefly? Yeah, those are both just basically in our capital plan. So we have a group that meets. Uh, I'm on a couple of city councilors, a public works uh, commissioner, and the city manager, a few others. Uh, and we vet the uh, spending on capital improvements over a period of time. And that's part of our long-term budgeting. We talked about the increase, the million-dollar increase that we're spending. So all that money is part of our capital spending plan, and so these bond, the bonding money that's in that is part of that plan. So it's built into our budget forecast, so it's nothing that's... So we've got sort of bonding increments over a period of time uh, for sort of larger scale investments. A recreation center, is that in the future bonding? That's and a, how much you, bonding uh, can the city I, I don't afford the for city, a I don't think center. the city would have, the, in my view, the tax capacity to support bonding for that kind of a program. That is one where I would have supported, probably would in the future, a, a local option tax if, you know, I, I'd sort of caveat that. I would, be, I would consider uh, supporting a local option tax to support a project like that. That's kind of what I had in mind. Something that would happen, because I, I think a recreational facility in Montpelier could be a huge draw for young people. We talk about wanting to draw young families here. If we had a recreation facility where people could bring their kids, you know, older people could recreate uh, all ages, uh, you know, we all tend to hibernate for the winter. This is a tough climate. And I think socially it's difficult. Having a rec center can transform a community, and I think it's one that we could, should think about. I'm glad we have a group that's looking at it. You know, it's a challenging, uh, I think they've had, it set some high parameters in part because they want to be downtown, and developing, having a multi-million dollar facility downtown is going to be really difficult. But uh, I hope they continue to look at it, and I, and I think just finding some other ways to fund it is going to be important. Uh, John, looking back before you became mayor, what didn't you accomplish that you thought maybe was within your grasp? Well, the biggest as challenge. As you're yeah. not the only person on a council. Sure. Um, no, I think we've ticked off a lot of them. The, the biggest was not making more progress on these projects that I had, you know, the, the bike path and the Taylor Street. Those were, it'd be hard to overstate the frustration and of not Saban's being pasture. able. And yes, yeah, Saban's Pasture to a lesser degree. That was a little out of our control. You know, that's, so I can say on that one, I think I've, pushed as hard and worked as hard as I could to make that happen. Really not much we can do. That's a private landowner's decision about whether he's going to develop his parcel. The others were really city projects. And uh, I, it is a great source of frustration that we weren't able to have those finished or at least start construction on either of those during my tenure. I wouldn't have, couldn't have contemplated that six years ago that that would have that we would not have had shovels in the ground on either of those. But, uh, you know, we're going to get there. So that would be, I'd say, the one. But, we'll, you know, so that one I think is going to be checked off hopefully uh, next year. Now, I had one final question. When are you going to take the long vacation with your wife, Jen, to make up for all those meetings at the school board and city <laughs> council that, that she we, lost you? We got a few trips planned, uh, but she... Uh, yeah, so we got a few, a few uh, trips planned. So. I just wanted to say, on behalf of Orca, you know, I wanted to say thank you for all the years that you've been on Orca, been a star in those meetings. Uh, we appreciate it here. And well, Orca's, uh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, well, let me just say thank you for all your work, Richard. I know you've been uh, one who pays attention to what goes on in the city and then communicates that. Uh, through ORCA, which is a huge community service, and then the work that ORCA does just in the tedium of filming our meetings and making our uh, process publicly accessible is a great, uh, a great public service, so thank you for that. And I also want to say on behalf of all people in Montpelier, thank you for the years, not only at, at City Council as mayor, but also at the school board as president. And I'd like now to speak to you. Thank you, And Richard. say that what's important is to watch these shows, to watch all the candidates. We have contested races in all three districts, excellent candidates. Uh, Ann Watson has her show to speak to what she would do as mayor. So she'll be stepping the way that John did mm -hmm. six years ago. And basically, we have the city budget. We have the school budget coming up presented. 
and get yourself accommodated to the, we also had John Odom who spoke on, on the city clerk and get yourself ready to get out and vote because that's really important and make sure that your family votes and your friends vote because that's the vitality of our town. And as John will say, there's a lot of boards and commissions in this town and they're all populated with the volunteers. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we all step forward at least to make our opinions known on town meeting day and keep Montpelier the town that you want it to be. Thank you.